Good morning. Am I on? Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. It's great to see you all came back. <laughs> um, it was a great day yesterday. I hope you all had great evenings, had a chance to talk about the day, connect with each other. Uh, we have a lot of great content lined up today, some great breakout sessions, great plenaries. Um, it's just going to be a packed day. And then, of course, we're going to end with our reception. Um, which is always a nice time to connect again. Um, I know we said this yesterday, but I'm gonna bring it back on the table. If you haven't downloaded the app and connected with people through the app, we really encourage you to do that today. Um, that's where we're posting announcements, any changes. It's a great place when you're on the Hill tomorrow to connect with people. We're also gonna be pushing out an evaluation for the event. We really wanna hear your feedback for when we plan this next year. So if you, can, if you haven't downloaded the app, do that today. Um, it would be great. Um, we're gonna kick off the day with a fantastic plenary discussion about making college work. And I'd like to invite our panelists to come up on stage. Good morning, everybody. How are you? So thank you, Rachel, for the introduction. Um, we're going to get right into the discussion in a minute. But before we get started, we have video greetings from a, a couple key policymakers to share with you. Uh, first, we'll be hearing from Representative Lisa Blunt Rochester of Delaware and then Senator Mike Braun of Indiana, both of, both of whom are co-leads of the JOB Act and uh, play key roles as workforce champions in Congress. So let's get it rolling. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day two of the National Skills Coalition's annual Skills Summit, the first one since 2020. I want to thank the coalition, including CEO Andy Van Clunen, for his leadership, the board of directors, and the many dedicated staff who helped make today's event possible. I'm sure by now you're engaging in meaningful discussions with a broad coalition of stakeholders about ways in which we can support, strengthen, and diversify our workforce. These goals are at the very core of my work and have been really my entire career, from my time as Delaware Secretary of Labor, Director of State Personnel, and CEO of the Metropolitan Wilmington Urban League, to my current work in Congress where I serve on the Energy and Commerce Committee and as the founder and co-chair of the bipartisan Future of Work Caucus. We know how important our workforce is to our collective future. Building and strengthening that workforce starts with ensuring that all workers have access to the resources and programs that can help them succeed because they need to be prepared to take on the jobs of today and the jobs of tomorrow. Just this week, I visited a local union training facility in Delaware that offers training and apprenticeship programs to help people gain the skills they need to take on more in-demand jobs. The individuals I met were adult age students taking courses to learn valuable construction skills that will help Delaware implement projects being funded through historic legislation we passed, such as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Chips and Science Act. Not only will these workers be qualified and ready for immediate good paying jobs when they complete their training, but they will also be in demand for many years to come. And we know it's just as important that we not only invest in these post-secondary job training programs and apprenticeships, but ensure that they are affordable and accessible. That's why I joined my colleague, Mikey Sherrill, Democrat from New Jersey, as well as Ohio Republicans, Bill Johnson and Mike Turner, in reintroducing the bipartisan Jumpstart Our Businesses by Supporting Students Act, also known as the Jobs Act. This legislation will expand Pell Grant eligibility, not only to those seeking four-year degrees, 
but to individuals looking to pursue short-term, high-quality education and training programs. The JOBS Act expands opportunities for workers of all ages to gain valuable, transferable skills to fill in-demand jobs. All in all, our bill would help workers secure good-paying jobs, strengthen our nation's competitiveness, and help close the workforce shortage gaps impacting industries across the economy and our country. And with the continued support of the National Skills Coalition, I'll continue to champion this bill and look forward to working with you to get it across the finish line. Again, thank you all for so many things that you accomplish and that you do, and we continue to look forward to the partnership. Hello, Senator Braun here. I wish I could join you today to talk about the important issue of skills training. Workforce development is something I hear about all the time, a lot before COVID, even more so now. I tour every county and hear about it all the time. We have millions of open jobs that need filling. The United States needs to make skills training a priority if we're going to stay competitive on the world stage. I believe if the federal government is going to offer grants for students to go to college, that money should also be available for students who want to go into skills training of some sort. That's why I wrote the JOBS Act with Senator Tim Kaine. The JOBS Act makes Pell Grant funds available for high quality, shorter term job training programs. Career and technical education programs would be included. Low workforce participation is a serious problem and one way we can address it is by helping Americans get the skills they need to fill jobs that are open today. The JOBS Act is bipartisan, it's common sense, and it won't add a penny to our national debt. The National Skills Coalition endorsed this solution, and we're glad to have your support. Thank you for all you're doing to grow our economy and fill good-paying American jobs. Hope you have a great Skills Summit. All right, we're going to get started. I'm Paul Fain. I'm your moderator. I'm a journalist covering connections between education and work. And our topic today is making college work. As you know, the pandemic accelerated enrollment declines uh, happening across higher education. Community college sector was particularly hit hard. Um, yet, we know that prospective students are interested in pursuing post-secondary education. They've just got a lot of doubts about the payoff, uh, about the many paths that they could choose. And, um, you know, one thing we're seeing is there's increasing interest in getting started quickly, getting to work while pursuing a short-term credential, and I have a feeling we're going to hear a little bit about that. So first, I'm going to introduce our panelists, uh, but just, just remember, I am going to leave some time for your questions at the end, so keep thinking of them, and I'll, I'll flag you down at the end. All right, uh, we have four panelists joining us today. To my left, Indi Dutta Gupta, President and Executive Director of the Center for Law and Social Policy, also known as CLASP. CLASP is a national nonpartisan nonprofit organization advancing policy solutions for people with low incomes. Thanks for being here. Uh, to his left is Ann Kress, President of Northern Virginia Community College. At NOVA, Dr. Kress focuses on fulfilling the college's commitment to equity and opportunity and it's promised that every student succeeds, every program achieves, and every community prospers. Thank you. To her left, Jennifer Stittert, a senior fellow at the National Skills Coalition at NSC. Jennifer is part of the Government Affairs team and focuses on post-secondary education and workforce policy. And then finally, last but not least, Jermaine Williams, president of Montgomery College in Maryland, just up the road here. Much of his work in higher education is focused on improving access for students as well as retention, graduation, and post-completion success. Thank you all. All right, we're gonna start with Indy. Let's talk about uh, providing greater access. Uh, why, why do students need more access to high-quality post-secondary education and training opportunities? Well, first, thanks, Paul, and uh, thanks to the other panelists. It's a pleasure to join you all. Let me say that fundamentally, post-secondary education opportunities can either contribute to social reproduction and reproduce the class, the class we the classes people are in, and even some of the occupations, or it can contribute to equalizing opportunity. And 
Expanding access is key to making sure it does more of the latter than the former. Uh, in particular, our economy suffers from significant occupational segregation by gender, by race, and beyond. Um, and what this does is it basically concentrates people who are already marginalized often in occupations that then pay less and are tougher occupations to advance in. Now, we at class certainly believe that every job should be a decent job, but it's also the case that some jobs will always be better than other jobs. So expanding access to high quality post-secondary education can help us tackle uh, that challenge and help promote upward uh, mobility. Now, the thing is, uh, high quality post-secondary education has benefits beyond the individual benefits in the labor market. Right? So we know that overall, it can expand our economic activity and raise living standards. Right? We know that it can improve people's health. And I want to emphasize that post-secondary education really has never been and should never be solely about the labor market outcomes. It can also strengthen our democracy. It can prepare people to contribute to our democracy, to actively engage in our democracy. And overall, uh, I think that post-secondary education, access, and of course completion. We don't want people to <clears throat> simply enroll in these programs and not get the benefit out of it because it's al already a risky proposition, uh, but is central to a broader agenda uh, for economic prosperity for all. Thanks for that. Uh, I'm gonna turn to Jennifer next. As you know well, over the past decade, nearly every state adopted a post-secondary attainment goal to increase education levels of their adult population and to better align with the workforce. That completion agenda, I feel like we're in a next wave of higher ed reform now focused more on connections with careers, but can you give, give us a sense of the advantage of setting a goal like that and, and if there are any shortcomings? Sure, thanks so much, Paul, and good morning, everyone. So, you know, to answer this question, I'd like to go back in time a little bit, you know, to where we were a decade or so ago. Um, around 2009, when President Obama took office, you know, they put forth this challenge, and the idea was that by 2020, which seems kind of funny now, um, the U.S. would lead all nations in college graduates. And you know, this was one of the first times where we looked at college graduates, they weren't just considering individuals with baccalaureate degrees. They were considering individuals with associate's degrees as well. And this, you know, obviously we didn't meet that goal or even really come that close to it, but it also sort of set off this this trend and you know this wave in policy, then you saw states starting to adopt you know goals as well. You saw additional investments because if you're going to set these goals, the next question is, well, how do you get there, and do we have the right investments in place? So we saw you know some really big proposals come out federally from this. Um, you know some were funded, some weren't. Uh, for example, we had the TAA Community College and Career Training Grant. That sort of spurred out of this. I mean, we don't have that level of investment today, but we still have the Strengthening Community Colleges Grant that runs out of DOL. We also saw this big proposal was the American Graduation Initiative, and I don't know if folks remember that, um, but it was this big investment in community colleges to essentially get folks to, you know, enter, graduate, retention, additional support services. Um, you know, and eventually the college promise proposal that we saw in the federal government came out of that, and we saw a lot of states and institutions take that up as well. Um, on the state level now, we have the majority of states that have adopted some type of post-secondary credential attainment goal. And I don't know if our Lumina Foundation people are in the room, but they're, they're one of the ones that invested a whole lot of time and effort into this overall. So, it's kind of interesting when you look like from state to state though, when you look at those post-secondary credential attainment goals, they do vary somewhat. I mean, a few of them are still looking at like back degrees and associate degrees, but a lot of them realize like in order to meet, you know, 60% of your population, 65, 70% that are going to have some type of credential, you need to also consider the non-degree space as well. So it sort of rose that up in, in the eyes of policymakers, as far as like, well, what do we need to do to get folks there? You know, and you see some states and they're like, well, okay, we'll count, we'll count any credential. Like, any credential can count towards our goals. 
But you see other states that are a little more sophisticated in this. They're not just looking at any credential. They're looking at high value credentials, high quality credentials that lead to good jobs. And some states, you know, like Colorado, they included an equity goal in that. You know, they realized that in order for us to attain these percentages, we can't just ignore entire populations. We have to see where the gaps are, and we have to make policy in order to be able to fill those gaps overall. So, you know, I think we're on a wave in many ways, not just at a federal level, but a state level, and sort of recognizing that we need to raise up these types of policies because more and more jobs and more and more good jobs are requiring some type of post-secondary credential. Mm -hmm. Great. So I, I want to turn to our, our college leaders now. Um, just, you know, obviously the barriers that students face in higher education were in sharper relief in the pandemic. We learned a little bit. Um, we were reminded a little bit of what those barriers are. Um, but could you just give a sense now what you're seeing, what's preventing students from enrolling or, or from getting to completion? And let's start with Dr. Kress. Sure. Well, thank you so much for this incredibly important discussion. And, and so I, but I want to answer that question, but I want to give an example of um, two students I talked with a couple weekends ago. NOVA is a large institution. We have over 70,000 students, six campuses. Five of them are comprehensive, but one of them is a standalone medical education campus. And to the point around students starting and stopping or not really finding those pathways, so I talked to a number of students who are in our EMT paramedic program. And I asked one young woman, you know, what drew her to this program? And she was very honest. She said, I started at Nova and I dropped out. She said, this was not for me. I thought college was not for me. And then I was talking to a friend who was an EMT and I, I, the student asked her, where did you go to school? And she said, Nova. And she said, wait, Nova has an EMT program? And so she re-enrolled and now she's about to graduate. And then I talked to a young man and I said, what drew you to this program? And he said, I actually started in high school dual enrollment. And I, he was very honest about himself. I hated sitting in the classroom. I was not that student. I probably would have dropped out of high school if it weren't for this. He said, but then I found this program and it's like, I found the greatest job of my life. He said, and I'm actually gonna make some really good money doing this. So I do think one of the things that we're seeing post pandemic is a, re a greater call for relevance of education all education, whether it's baccalaureate, um, community college, um, anything that's post-secondary education. And I think we're seeing more and more students who, because of all of the vagaries that the pandemic created, are really thinking through, how will I invest my time, which we're seeing is incredibly important for students, but also how will I, inc I invest my resources? Um, we're very lucky in the Commonwealth of Virginia to be able to fund both non-credit and credit um, post-secondary education um, through some federal or state aid that provides students, if they're in non-credit, what's called fast forward, and I can talk a little bit more about that later. If they're in credit, what's called G3, which is get skilled, get a job, get ahead, as long as they're in um, a career pathway. But I do think those are some of the issues we're seeing, is that you know the sense of time, that sense of urgency, at a time when, you, as you mentioned, that community college enrollments across the country are going down, our enrollments in our short-term non-credit training programs, four months or less are up year on year 11% and last year they were up over 30%. I do think there's a real sea change in the way we see students thinking about their post-secondary education opportunities, but I also think um, what we saw during the pandemic is how incredibly financially fragile so many of our students are in community colleges. So having that ability to access financial aid, having that ability to access benefits on our campuses, which I know are available at Montgomery as well, around food pantries, around childcare vouchers, around assistance in accessing benefits for transportation and housing are ever more critical. But again, you wrap that all around, that notion of economic and social mobility. If we're gonna hold out that promise, that promise needs to be real and that's incumbent on our institutions. Thanks for that. Uh, Dr. Williams, can you talk a little bit about the barriers students face at your institution? Absolutely. Good, good morning, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. It's really thankful to be involved in this important conversation and so much of what she was shared really, really resonates and I think about, um, you know, kind of taking a step back from that, from that question and we consistently will, you know, how do we engage students, right? I would encourage us to 
think about you know, how we're engaging our, our communities, right? Our, our, our residents, right? The idea of students is that almost like they're already here and they're just, they're really you know, want to be students and they're just, what are we going to do to kind of amplify their, this effort? And this idea, when I think about Montgomery County and the 40,000 students we serve at the college and 1.1 million individuals in our county, I think about first generation individuals. I think about new arrivals. I, I think about historically marginalized and underrepresented groups. I think about even in, out, in an affluent county, the approximately 20,000 individuals a month who are unemployed, not underemployed. I think about the four to 5,000 students who graduate each year from our public school who don't directly pursue a post-secondary educational opportunity that's credit bearing. I think about the individuals who want to get upskilled, reskilled, and career change, right? When they're students, there's so much more things we can do that are, that are different. When we think about them in terms of community and the thoughts that resonate in terms of ensuring there's access, completion, and post-completion success, that we have credentials of economic, social, and community value that lead to a family-sustaining wage and enable our residents to contribute to the public good because we know that individual economic and social mobility will lead to intergenerational mobility, right? And that is truly, you know, why so many of us are here. So when I, I'd ask to take a step back and referring to that, that question, and I'll get in some three quick things. I think about the financial landscape. And Dr. Kress, you know, mentioned this. How, how do we have a financial aid infrastructure that really speaks to the needs, holistically, of our students? That really speaks to childcare and, and, and housing and transportation. Right. Um, how do we look at the, secondly, the value proposition and the competing demands? Although our residents don't always say value proposition, um, <laughs> the reality, as we know, is that in order for them to attend a, a post-secondary education opportunity, they often need to stop work and or work less. Right. And we often say and review and analyze education as a commodity. However, arguably, I, I would say it's a, it's a unique commodity in the sense of you dedicate your time, a lot of other resources, and you kind of, at the end, you leave with a hope of a job. I don't think anybody else buys milk like that. You go to the store, <laughs> you pay for your milk, you come home with your milk, right? So when we think about that value proposition, right, and what we're asking our residents to do with their competing demands, 66% of our students are part-time. About 15% of our students are parenting. How do we holistically look at the situation and provide those equitable opportunities that are gonna create access, completion, and post-completion success? And the last thing I'll say ever so briefly is a, a sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. That continuum of residents that I just shared, and there are so many more categories. How do they see themselves in the places and spaces where we offer post-secondary education? How do they see themselves and their culture showing up in, in the staff, in the faculty? in the curricula, in the policies, right? How do they see themselves in the workforces that we all want them to so aggressively be part of, right? We're yearning for them to be part of that, and how do we create that, that sense of belonging for them? So, thanks for that. So, Indy, uh, you know, Dr. Williams talked about first-gen students, uh, their underserved groups. Can you give us a sense of the role for policy in supporting equity for, for students and workers? Yeah, absolutely, Paul. I think we've, we've uh, gotten some hints of it here already, right? So let's start with the financial landscape, as Dr. Kress described. Uh, students face uh, not only significant costs, but significant risks, as I mentioned, right? So this is uh, an investment with some serious risks, both because of uncertainty in the labor market and uncertainty even completing a program uh, with some value in the labor market. So how can we reduce that risk? I think there's a couple of things we can do. One is addressing tuition. I am delighted to see policymakers having taken on debt, but we have to stop the accumulation of debt in the first place. And so policymakers can take that on through uh, a range of options, including uh, financial aid, but also finding ways to partner with states, community college systems, to. Uh, reduce those costs faced by students in the first place. And let's not forget the cost beyond tuition. Some community colleges have very affordable tuition, even for some students who uh, make, have very limited resources in their family. But think about all the other costs, including from reducing their time working 
when they might be a caregiver, as we've heard already from, from uh, both of our um, uh, leaders and community colleges here. Um, and I, I would also just note that uh, this is sort of coming back to my, my uh, hitting on the democracy theme. Um, we need to design solutions with students and not just for students, right? And I think that is quite apparent here. Um, and only 10 states uh, mandate that students be represented on uh, the, the state boards. Um, only five give them uh, voting rights. Uh, so, if we want to directly uh, improve the lives of students, we have to include them in the process. The final thing I want to note is that uh, we have to, and you're seeing this here, uh, so there's really no excuses because we've got two incredible leaders here who are doing it. You have to aggressively pursue diversity, especially racial diversity. And th this is going to be particularly challenging in the wake of an expected Supreme Court decision around affirmative action, but uh, there is no substitute in my view, as creative as we may have to get after that, for aggressively and directly pursuing that diversity, especially racial diversity. As it is, every new generation is more racially diverse than the previous one. Uh, we have an extraordinary, I don't know what it is now, maybe eight to one uh, well, black-white differential in wealth, in household net worth. Um, we have substantial uh, wealth gaps by other, when you look at other races compared to white households too, some of that is intergenerational wealth that has been passed on. But these are not students that, the students we need to pull in are not ones where their parents are gonna go be able to go and take out a home equity line of credit or a second mortgage. So we have to be very creative and understand what it's gonna to take to make sure that those who are accessing and achieving and realizing these credentials look like America. Thanks for that. Uh, I'm gonna turn to Jennifer now. Um, so speaking about greater access to financial aid, uh, Jennifer, what are some of the current barriers and are there any policy proposals aimed at expanding access for learners? Anne's laughing because <laughs> the question is like a lob for the JOBS Act and yes. she's like, but I'm not going to just talk about the JOBS Act. But you could. I could just talk about the JOBS Act, but it's, but it's more complicated yes. than that, right? Yeah. Like, and when we think about it and we think about access to financial assistance for these students, it's, there are real barriers and then there are barriers that we have created because the system is so complex. Yeah. Um, you know, for years and years I, I worked primarily just on higher ed space. And, and when you look at DC and you think about like lobbyists generally and, and where they are, you have like, you know, different echelons and tiers of them. They always say the healthcare space, every disease has two lobbyists. Um, you know, Harvard alone, I think they have like five or six here in DC. Um, you know, the community colleges, they probably have like six now. They might have as many as Harvard. Um, and then, you know, the workforce space, a lot of you all, like, and us are kind of pioneers in some ways. We don't have this army of individuals that are going, and that's why it's so important that you're here right now in many ways, because, you know, you are raising up these issues. I, I would say the other thing is that we've made the workforce system very, very complex in many ways. And, and I'll talk a little bit about the JOBS Act and financial aid and sort of real barriers. Right now, you know, our higher education system was set up, I mean, it, the Higher Education Act was passed in 1965. And the vision of that was sort of like, okay, well, you know, we have students and they're gonna go to a campus and they're gonna get their baccalaureate degree. And we have evolved since then. You know, particularly over the last couple of decades, I think we've recognized more and more that we have more non-traditional students in the space, or as we call them, like new traditional, because they do make up the majority. Um, but, you know, what, where are the barriers still? And, and some of that is for individuals that are attending shorter term programs overall. We have a bright line right now when it comes to eligibility for financial aid, and that means you know Pell Grants, Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grants, Federal Work Study, Direct Loans in most cases. You know These programs have to be 600 clock hours or above or at least 15 weeks in length or you know the relative semester hours. So you know for years and years we've been okay, well we wanna, we wanna lower that threshold for programs that are within that space. You know, but it's not, that is a big symbolic move. You know, and it's not just going to be federal dollars. A lot of state dollars and state financial aid is, is tied to that federal threshold as well. So this is kind of a domino effect 
in many ways. Um, you know, additionally, you'll hear about this afternoon, we have a, a new proposal called the Skills Scholarship, and basically this is sort of a re-envisioning of some ways of our, our workforce system making, making those dollars a little more available, streamlined, more for students, making the system easier. Um, you know, I, I, last week someone asked me, well, how do you fund, how do you fund short-term and non-credit programs? And I said, are, are you sure you want to ask that question? Um, you know, I kind of liken it to, I, I don't know how many of you watched like the BBC Sherlock Holmes <laughs> back like 15 years ago, um, but like Benedict Cumberbatch was in it and he would do this thing called the Mind Palace whenever he really had to like leave his body and like move things in his mind. I have to sort of go in like a trance state when I describe all the different ways that we can fund, you know, shorter term programs overall. Because, yeah, you have like your state aid programs and you might have like an estate five or six different ones that might be options. You have SNAP, ENT, you have TANF, you have, you know, Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. You might use, you know, if you're a Hispanic serving institution, you might use funds from that. You could use strengthening institutions program. I can go on and on and on. But the problem is, you know, Yes, folks at institutions and, you know, individuals who are running workforce training programs can kind of figure this out, but for students, yeah. you don't have like a system where you really understand and can go in. And comparatively, when you look at the higher education system, we've created a much easier pathway. Like, students know the Pell Grant, they fill out their FAFSA, like we kind of just, we have a pathway for them, you know. A, a few years ago, they came up with this idea of the financial aid shopping sheet. I don't know if folks remember that, but it was this way to say, okay, well, how do we give students a list of like how they can figure out what their aid is for you know their program that they go into? In workforce, no one's ever like said, wow, this is really you know how are we going to do that? And you don't have hundreds of lobbyists weighing in on some type of shopping sheet for those individuals. And fundamentally, we just need to make the system easier mm -hmm. for those students. And we've seen a lot of states that have done that in many ways. You know, Virginia's mm -hmm. an example of it, but you know, federally we're still ways away from coming up with that streamlined system and you know, a lot of the policies that we were talking about this week would take a step forward in that. Just quickly, Jennifer, uh, when you were talking about uh, you know, workforce education lobbying, I was thinking this is that very rare issue that's actually not very partisan right now. Um, and I'm wondering, how do we keep it there? Can it be kept there? <laughs> so this was brought up yesterday in, in some ways by, by our panel that talked about, you know, going to the Hill and talking about, yes, everyone likes workforce policy. It's a big bipartisan issue, but the, the challenge is making it number one in the mind of your representative. And I think the complexity of the system sometimes adds to that in some ways. So they need individuals who are an expert to try to explain that to them. So in some ways, this is your role going to the Hill. Like, you're connecting with these individuals so they can better understand the system. So when they say we want more individuals in workforce training, they can actually know what that means and articulate their asks in order to try to raise that up to number one. Because right now, a lot of it's just kind of like, okay, well, we like workforce training, but we don't, we don't know how to like take that a step further. Sure, thanks for that. Uh, Dr. Kress, mm -hmm. when writing about, speaking about short-term credentials for high demand professions, Virginia, uh, fast forward and G3, your, your programs mm -hmm. are really examples one and, and two. Um, can you give us, you mentioned briefly, but can you give us the skinny on how these programs work, what you've learned in the process? Sure, absolutely. So, and I will say, you know, to the point about bipartisan programs, Fast Forward, which started in Virginia um, with the less um, fun name of Workforce Credentials Grant, which really draws people in, um, <laughs> it was started by a Democratic governor, but it has been expanded by our current Republican governor because it's driven by business. And I do think while we may not, for this, um, for workforce have a single lobbyist, or but we do have business leaders who are so desperate for talent, and that's what started in Virginia, is um, what's called Fast Forward now, and what Fast Forward is, is a workforce um, credential grant that provides essentially two-thirds of the cost of any of these in-demand credentials, and I'll come back to that in a second, so that a student um, pays one-third of the cost, up to $3,000, 
but thanks to G3, that can be scholarshiped because G3 works for credit and non-credit programs. So that $3,000 for 75% of our students is zero, zero. And these are credentials that are four months or shorter. Um, the consistent data across the state, because the State Council on Higher Education for Virginia is required by law to do an annual report on fast forward credentials, shows that across the state, those four months will add 28% in real wage gains on average to individual participants. In our region, Northern Virginia, because it's a more expensive place, it's closer to 36%, but that's four months. And you're talking about individuals who sometimes go into this program making zero dollars, right? So now they're suddenly on that first step of a ladder, and I'll come back to that as well. So the requirement for fast forward credentials is that they be directly related to a region's workforce needs. So there needs to be a job at the end, otherwise you can't offer it, right? And it's, it's done by region. So we work really closely with our workforce investment boards. They actually set the criteria for what programs will be offered. And so a couple things I'll mention about NOVA. We've now started, through our workforce area, a guaranteed interview program for each one of those credentials. So not only do you know that it will lead to a job, we're going to put you directly in front of an employer who's interested in hiring you, right? So we're trying to make this as end-on-end -end as possible. It also, the program also pays for the credential that might be required. So if you're in a, a computer program, it's gonna pay for that, that um, credential. If you're in a CNA program, it's gonna pay for that licensure. So then it's incumbent upon the institution to say, okay, there's no wrong door here. So that industry recognized credential is gonna be worth credit towards a credit program. So for all of those um, industry recognized credentials, we've actually mapped them to a credit package that then can move a student into an associate's degree where, lo and behold, they get G3. So about 60% of the students in our career and technical education programs, which for us are largely in IT and healthcare because of the industries in our region, that 60% doesn't pay tuition, right? Then on top of that, if you are at 400% poverty or below, the state of Virginia through G3 will give you a wraparound grant for childcare. But if you're a student at NOVA, then we can also access our C campus grants. Um, childcare access means parents in schools, rolls right off, right? So, um, so those grants then can help you with child care vouchers. We have a partnership with the Capital Area Food Bank where if you're a parenting student, um, thanks to an investment from M&T Bank, we'll deliver that food to your home because we know that time poverty is an issue. You can access telemental health services. You can access financial stability. So really, it takes you in that whole pipeline. And then even with those applied degrees, we have opportunities for you to transfer and move on to your baccalaureate degree if you want to. So it's the combination of the financial aid, but to Jennifer's point, making that path very, very clear for students so that this never stops. And by the way, the one thing I forgot to mention is we partner with our localities. So if you're a G3 student in cyber and you've got to take credentials along the way, G3 doesn't pay for those, but through our Achieving Career Excellence Grant, we will pay for those. So that $500, that $700, you'll never have to have that come out of pocket. As long as you've got to be your better in the course and are willing to set for a little test prep, we'll make sure that you get that credential, right? Because that's typically what folks will hire off of. Why is all of this important? I'll end with this. I sat on um, a panel last week on the Chips and Science Act. So the estimates are that two thirds of the jobs coming through the Chips and Science Act investment will be below the baccalaureate level, right? Requires some post-secondary education, but not a bachelor's degree, not a graduate degree, nothing. Sometimes even just a short-term certificate. So the example that was given was that in Maricopa, um, Intel is providing 10-day intensive training to get that first credential. And as I pointed out on that panel, that's amazing. Who pays for that? Right? When Intel says, we've done our community service, we're not going to pay for this anymore, how do those folks in Maricopa County pay for that training? Because right now, we don't have any federal way of providing funds for that. Right? So that's the critical part of this. There is a huge need for this workforce. Virginia has really figured it out, and we are a national model, but you, doing it state by state leaves too many states out. 
Well, speaking about uh, paying for it, um, Dr. <laughs> Williams, Maryland, uh, you've got the Community College Promise Scholarship Program uh, that provides tuition assistance for both degree and non-degree students. Could you talk about that scholarship as well as uh, other initiatives at the state or your institution to be more affordable? Absolutely, and uh, I think one of the high points of that scholarship, it's for, for Maryland Community College students, it is uh, up to $5,000 for a scholarship, and one of the big pieces you, you mentioned in that intro, the question, is that it's for, for credit and, and non-credit, um, which, is, which, is, which is immense when we're talking about short-term credentials that you know, really provide a, a, a toehold onto the, the rung of economic mobility and into professions. So that is um, a fantastic opportunity for our students in, in Maryland. One of the really wonderful components of this that just happened um, in, in legislature in, in Maryland is they're actually decentralizing this. Decentralizing the promise program. So B16 community colleges will have the opportunity to actually administer the funds. Mm -hmm. Yes, so this was held centrally uh, within the state and um, for a lot of reasons, we'll get into that after the session, uh, <laughs> there was a decision made that we would decentralize it, which we have a very strong belief and a high level of confidence will help us provide more access to the residents of, of, of Maryland. Uh, one of the other awesome components about this new legislation is that it's also going to make it eligible for part-time students. Right, so back to 66% of our 40,000 plus students are part-time, right? And you have a, a, a promise program that's not available for part-time students. What impact are we really seeking, right? Jennifer, we talked about, you know, what, what policies are we creating that are, you know, going to create the change that we seek? So having those two adjustments we think are absolutely uh, phenomenal. One of the other pieces is, um, for state jobs, and I think about affordability, you know, we've all heard about the, the paper ceiling and, mm -hmm. and STARS. Maryland has, you know, dedicated, you know, this kind of reevaluation of state jobs and looking at individuals who are, who are STARS, you're probably familiar with that, you know, skilled, you know, through uh, alternative um, routes. And um, so that is also plays into affordability when we think about getting individuals into jobs and or transitioning to jobs. Uh, one of the pieces I think about in terms of also, as well as Dr. Kress said, you know, it's not just a college, you know, the Promise program, but it is how we're funded in general, and we are funded for some non-credit opportunities, mm -hmm. which creates a world of opportunity for, for our students and our ability to be able to provide those uh, programs for them. Another piece we talk about, and when you were telling that, I was thinking, I was, I was going into my space, because I was thinking about, you know, kind of the institutionally, the braided funding that we do, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, if we can do that on the institutional level, we can definitely do that on the federal level. So I'm listening to you, Jennifer, and I'm just like, like yeah, so we collaborated with our uh, healthcare consortium in Montgomery County to be able to receive a federal earmark that's going to provide access for more healthcare training, needed, needed healthcare training. When we look at our partnership with our WIB, our Workforce Investment Board, it's a very similar situation that we're engaging in those conversations so we can find out what can we pull from the millions of institutional scholarships that we provide? What can we pull from you know, these federal monies? What can we pull from all these components in order to create an affordable situation for our residents that, that we know we need? Um, one of the other pieces I'll, I'll share because I see our, our, our time, this, this conversation is so great. I can't believe the time is moving at such a fast clip is, um, we have a wonderful partnership with our public school. So in Montgomery County, we have one public school system, Montgomery County Public Schools, MCPS, about 160,000 students, largest in the state. And high school students engage in dual enrollment for free. Mm -hmm. And that was actually codified in legislation that'll you know, it be enacted soon. But prior to that, we were, we were doing that. And you think about affordability, mm -hmm. and I think about, again, our residents, the 200 and more than 260 high school students that were receiving associates in IT and cybersecurity and business um, a few weeks before they received their high school diploma for free. I think about the healthcare fields, the students who are participating in nursing, who after two years in high school, right, their last two years, they have one more year and then they're 19 years old-ish going in and they're being nurses. 
Right, so when you think about that type of affordability and what we can do, um, if we're really thinking about creating change, there, there, there's so much that can be done. So, so looking beyond affordability, uh, obviously where we started, uh, students face other barriers, time, quite, quite a few others. Uh, Dr. Kress, Dr. Williams, any state or, or, or other policies you'd like to see more of that can make a difference? And do you want to start there? Sure. I, you know, one of the things, I'll put a few things out there. One is that um, there really isn't a regional difference for Pell Grants. Mm -hmm. So when you think about Northern Virginia, which is typically seen as a very affluent area, um, we have the five lowest income census tracts in the Commonwealth. And they're actually not too far from where I live, down um, the Highway 1 corridor. And, um, but there are students at NOVA who don't qualify for basic financial aid even credit programs because they make too much. But it's because it's so expensive to live in this region. We're not alone, right? There are other parts of the country just like this. So I do think that's, that's one issue that we see. The second is, you know, when you think about childcare and that one in five college students is a parenting student. Um, both, you know, everything from infants all the way to high school. And that brings additional costs. And there isn't um, right now a dedicated um, way of doing that as part of financial aid packaging in a very different way. You can apply as we did and, and receive the C Campus grant. But I do think a lot of this is simply about thinking uh, that our students are whole people, even part-time students, I always remind our legislators, are actually full-time people. Um, you know, we don't just see that one third of them that comes to us. So, you know, they come to us, they need advising, they need counseling, they need, so I think state funding sometimes is still done on that, and I know it is in, in the Commonwealth, on full-time equivalents, um, but our students aren't equivalents, they're real people. And I do think at the um, federal level, there is still that lack of sense of a holistic student and the new majority student. Right. Um, in addition to the Jobs Act, I would love for there to be like a fresh start pill. You know, what if you went down one road and suddenly the economy shifted and you used all your federal financial aid? Does that mean you never get any anymore? Um, you know, we are going to have multiple careers, but that is not the way aid is set up. Um, so I do think, you know, part of this is just a radical reimagining of what higher education does, who we serve, who we're not serving and who we're supposed to be serving. Dr. Williams, anything you wanna add there? Yeah, I would amplify that in terms of financial aid. We'll see what the simplification of FAFSA looks like when it actually gets rolled out. Uh, I'd be willing to bet it could probably be even uh, more simplified uh, when we see it. Uh, but so I think we were talking, having a conversation earlier about, about need, mm -hmm. right? And, and how do you establish need, mm -hmm. right? And, and the ways in which we do that, the ways, you know, the barriers that we've created that you must establish need in X way in order to receive Y. There, there are different ways that we can establish need beyond what we're doing that I think would open the doors to more students being able to pursue post-secondary education. And obviously, you know, the, the power of Pell, we're looking at, you know, geographically, if we're looking at short-term Pell, we're looking at, you know, being able to use that beyond tuition and fees mm -hmm. for basic needs. Um, the one other piece I would, I would share, and it's along Dr. Creston line of the, the child care, is, um, you know, we serve whole students, right, mm -hmm. whole, whole people. There's also not like this switch that you flip after high school yes. that says, yes. oh, you're now a college student. Right. We know you're receiving free and reduced meals, but you don't need that support anymore because you're no longer in high school. Right. Right, so we have a national school lunch program, uh, but it doesn't count if you're in college a few months later because something, I don't know what happens at high school commencement, but apparently people are guaranteed all the food that they want after that because you, you, you can't participate in that in, you know, when you're in college. So I think when we talk about those conversations, similarly with the childcare is, mm -hmm. how are we meeting you know, the, the basic needs? 36%, and I'll end on this, our most recent survey, 36% of our students in an affluent county experienced some level of food insecurity in the past 30 days, mm -hmm. 36%. So like Dr. Kress, we partner with Capital Area Food Bank and we do so many things, but I mean, so that's another piece I'd lift yeah. up in terms of federal policy. Jennifer, anything you wanna add there? 
Um, you know, I think one of the things that really landed with me is the, the full-time equivalents mm -hmm. versus the headcount, you know, and it, it just kind of gets me fired up yeah. when I hear about it, to be honest, because, you know, for those who don't know, I, I worked on Capitol Hill during, um, during post-pandemic. I actually started with the Senate Help Committee two days before the pandemic, like, officially started and then never returned to the office for a year and a half. Um, but, you know, there was a huge fight over full-time equivalent. Yes. Like, yes. we talked about this higher education emergency relief fund, and, you know, it, it seemed like a no-brainer. Like, mm -hmm. we're serving people, head count, but there was this huge swath of individuals who wanted full-time equivalent, and that is because, you know, the wealthier institutions out there that are they're serving those students, and they, they certainly serve their share of Pell students as well, but they, they were the ones who would benefit from the lion's share of it. So, you know, I mean, I guess going into this, like, there are competing interests mm -hmm. out there, and, you know, we just need to make sure the voices of our folks are, are in that room as well. Indeed, do you want to? Yeah, no, here? absolutely. Um, so, it's pretty remarkable how creative Dr. Kress, Dr. Williams are in addressing what are fundamental shortcomings in our broader system mm -hmm. of social protection. And we should keep that in mind. Uh, we are right now facing threats to Medicaid, SNAP, TANF, that could dramatically undermine the well-being of the folks that we're trying to serve here. And even if you see carve-outs for students on some of the so-called work and work reporting requirements, do you really want students to navigate those two? And uh, we have a farm bill also that's going through uh, every five-year reauthorization. Uh, and potential cuts to SNAP could make their jobs so much harder. So I completely agree with what's been said. Uh, the innovations and you know, bringing food banks to, to campus, connecting people to services and support, is exactly what I think we all hope we would be doing in a similar situation. But we also need to work on changing that baseline in the first place. Do you, you know, obviously folks here are about to go off and talk with policymakers. Any advice for them on how to tackle some of these priorities? There's a bunch of them. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I worked for four years in Congress as well on a committee. And you know, let me just start with uh, reminding us a bit of the landscape thinking about Congress. We have, uh, thanks to the last election, exactly one Gen Z elected mm -hmm. official in the United States Congress, Maxwell Frost. Mm -hmm. Um, from Central Florida, exactly one. I'm an older mil millennial. I am desperate to pass that baton along, okay? <laughs> um, so this is what you're going up against, right? Dr. Kress painted a picture, and I think that's the first thing to keep in mind. Paint a picture. Who are today's students? They're much more likely to be part-time, older, caregivers, students of color, and so on and also paint a picture about the benefits, right? Community colleges are anchor institutions often in their communities. They provide broad economic and other benefits to their communities. Um, and the second thing I would just leave you with is remember that you're the expert. However complicated this may seem, you are bringing expertise. You are bringing expertise from your state level experience, interacting with federal programs sometimes, or not interacting with them because of the challenges. You're bringing your expertise because of the people that you're serving and supporting. So always remember that you're the expert when you go up there. Great, Any, anyone else wanna to add to that one? I've got another question or two. Jennifer, sure, I, I'll add real quickly. Um, you know, and I, I think sometimes it's challenging going, going to Capitol Hill and the agencies to talk to folks, because you think about, well, Maybe what I have in expertise is, isn't, isn't relative, you know, relevant to what policy they're working on. And I think, you know, for you all, it, part of that is making that connection, right? You know, what is the problem? We need to frame the problem out there in a very simple way for individuals. Then, you know, what, what am I doing? What is my, you know, organization doing? What is my state doing? What is my institution doing in order to try to address that problem? And then you all have a list of, you know, policy priorities, we love that you go with those, but like, you know, you, you all are individuals and you're going to meet with your representatives. But tie that back to like, where, where are the gaps 
from the federal government, because these are federal policymakers. And, you know, some of it will be funding. We need more money. We need more money. We need more money. But it, it's not always that simple, too. So, and I think they're, you know, regardless of party affiliation, I think these individuals, you know, that are elected are genuinely looking for solutions for individuals, particularly in the workforce space. And there is a lot of goodwill and bipartisanship. So, you know, kind of coming up with, well, what are we doing? What could be the federal solutions? And, you know, if you just say money, 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 they're going to kind of like shut off a little bit. But, you know, there are more intricate ways we can kind of like address the system overall and, and trying to figure out where that lands with them and keeping that conversation going. Please. I, I would just say, you know, this is a business issue. Right, and um, you know, all politics is local. So for Northern Virginia, three quarters of the world's data flows through Northern Virginia. Right, anyone who's on their phone right now ignoring what we're saying, your data is flowing through Northern Virginia. Um, and so, you know, when we, uh, we've received over the past couple years close to $8 million in congressionally directed spending earmarks, but they've all been directly related to advocacy from our business community for a workforce. So I would say bring that workforce data. You know, businesses that are thinking about leaving, businesses that can't expand. I mean, you, some of you are business people. If, you know, bring those stories with you. Um, we were able to build, get a congressionally directed spending earmark to bridge CNA to LPN and LPN to RN, right? To, and why is that? Our largest hospital system needs 800 nurses today. No one's graduating 800 nurses. So, you know, I think that's part of it too, is make this a very local story around not just moving forward the lives of our students, which we think is very compelling, may not sell as well in some offices, but it is about how do you attract business, how do you keep business, right? Because that is where the game is played. Dr. Williams, you brought up uh, the paper ceiling, Opportunity at Works campaign uh, to elevate stars, folks who are skilled through alternative routes, including the associate degree, by the way. Uh, at Maryland, as you mentioned, is one of, I believe, seven states now to drop degree requirements for a large portion of state jobs. And of course, uh, many businesses, including apparently Intel, are, are trying to mm -hmm. prioritize uh, folks without bachelor's degrees in hiring. Can you talk about that really unusual moment we're having right now with credentialism and, and how that interest in looking beyond the degree in hiring can really be beneficial to some of the financial aid and other policies we've discussed here? Sure, absolutely. And I think it's, it is, it's breaking it, it down in terms of what the actual need is. I don't want to over, I don't want to oversimplify it, um, but what do we need individuals to do? And we've got into this cycle of saying, well, this job requires this level of education, right? Education, it's kind of like I was told more than two decades ago, if I get a four-year degree, I'll be okay. Right, and like two masters and a doctorate later, I'm okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, it's, but what do skills and having really, I'll provide an example, a really interesting conversation with a medical care provider who engaging is like, well, you know what, we don't need this master's level person. What we need are these essential skills met. And we can take this to a certain extent and break it down while the person is able to come meet an immediate, um, fill an immediate void that we have, and then continue, continue to work to that point where they have to get a licensure for something um, in order to do, but they don't need the MSW to do all of these jobs. So I think it really is challenging the opportunity and really embracing the immediacy with which we need jobs filled in certain fields at this point in time. And that is an engaging proposition for industry and business leaders. If we can get individuals in after 30 hours or 60 hours, and then, you know, and then they just keep gaining that education, but it takes breaking it down and saying, you know, this, this is what I need, and it takes that on the ground level of, okay, we will build a curricula based on what you need. And that's what Dr. Kress and I do. That's what we do at community colleges. Mm -hmm. We pivot to provide the needs of, of what our workforce are, our business and industry. So it's, I don't want to oversimplify it, but it's not that complex. I'm great that there's a movement now, mm -hmm. but it's really, it's really not that, that complex. 
Dr. Kress, how, how do you thread that needle? I mean, obviously you mentioned transfer. Uh, your institution mm -hmm. has always been ahead of the curve for transfer to Mason. If students want to pursue a bachelor's, that's good. <laughs> how do you thread this needle of taking advantage of this really exciting moment without hurting the degree? Sure, and I, but I would ask us to take a step back. So um, uh, NOVA, Northern Virginia Community College, partners with the Northern Virginia Chamber on what we call the Northern Virginia, you may sense a theme there, Workforce Index. And what was striking in the last index is that the majority of respondents, and these are business leaders in our region, said that they don't really see that the bachelor is required for an entry-level position, and the majority of them said they require it. <laughs> so, which when I spoke to them, I said, there's something going on here, y'all need to figure that out. But the, um, I think part of this then is making sure there's no wrong door. Right? I think that's the power of community colleges, not to toot our own horn, but there, it's not an end. And I do think um, when you look at the data from Credential Engine, for example, there's hundreds of thousands of credentials out there, tens of thousands of providers, and I would say the majority of those have no real marketplace value, but someone's paying for them and they're usually the most at-risk students that we would typically serve. So I do think it's incumbent on us to build those skills, and we sit down with employers big and small. We sit down with you know, Alarm.com, a small employer in the tech space, to Amazon Web Services, and scrape those skills and make sure that that's embedded in our curriculum and identify those industry-recognized credentials that will lead forward. But then, as I mentioned earlier, we need to give value to those industry-recognized credentials ourselves. We need to have our faculty sit down and say this is worth, as it is with some of the cloud um, certifications, 12 credit hours. That's almost an entire full-time semester, right? For federal student aid, it is. Um, and then you can take that 12 credit hours and move forward with an associate's degree. Then we need to sit down with transfer partners, um, big and small, including, for example, University of Maryland Global Campus, which is a great transfer partner for some of these non-traditional skills paths. Um, Mason is building that out as well. Private institutions for us, Marymount, where our students can then move forward. Right? So that we really need to make sure that what we haven't done is put our students, especially marginalized students, in a box where their credential only works for employer X and has no value anywhere else. And if we're doing that, shame on us. But I do think this is a moment when we ourselves need to take a step back and make sure that we're really serving our students authentically with integrity and respecting the time and energy and funds that they bring to each one of their engagements with us. Thanks for that. All right, on that note, um, I think we're gonna open it up to your questions. So I see one here. I think a microphone should be headed your way. I see another one, but let's start here. Um, and when you do get the mic, uh, please make sure you ask a question. Um, <laughs> okay, come this way. <laughs> that was great. I was gonna try to find a way to make a point about <laughs> the credential being valuable yes, and yeah. but you did it. So it's thank so you. important. Yes. Go ahead. Yep. Paul Sammons from Indiana. And the question is, on the underserved, how are we looking at returning citizens from incarceration? Mm -hmm. Obviously a lot of movement on that issue. Uh, who wants to take a first crack at that? Dr. Everyone. Williams? Yep. Yep. So sure. thank, you for, thank you for that question. We do have programs um, right now that we have instituted um, and that we're, we're continuing. One that I think of right now is actually, uh, we've called uh, coding, coding Your Way Home. Mm -hmm. And so individuals are learning tech skills um, while they are within facilities. And then we're providing transition opportunities uh, for them as well. There's also GED opportunity that we provide. So there's a high level of partnership uh, with, our, with our facilities in the county. I will say that um, I think we can do more and we need to do more, especially when it comes to the complexity and the comprehensive nature of what needs to be provided. It's not just a while an individual is within a facility or after they're at it. There's, there's a continuum there. What's happening while they're there? How are we working with the transition? And then after, you know, so it's there, I think there's an opportunity there, but we are um, having those conversations because we want to bolster our level of engagement. I'm sure Dr. Kress is doing similar. 
same, um, but I also think it's one of those areas where having real career coaching and counseling is important because, um, you know, and right or wrong, there are just some career pathways that are, that are closed to individuals based on what they might have done in their past, and we also try to have that conversation when we're in high school dual enrollment. Yes. Um, depending on um, what you're looking for, for example, Northern Virginia is a big government contracting area. Most of those positions require clearances, and some of the things you've done in your past may disallow you from getting those clearances. So I think this is a real important conversation because I, I will again say, I don't know that every provider is having that conversation with individuals who are formerly incarcerated and they're putting them in programs where they're using up their financial aid, they're using up their hard earned dollars, and at the end of the day, they're finding that they can't find employment. And I think that's terrible. Yeah. I would say really quickly, I, just, I think there also needs to be an examination of what it, what's what's prohibited? Yeah, exactly. Um, just yeah. because of the disproportionate yeah. yes, rate exactly. of individuals exactly. who are incarcerated, yeah. so those rules don't impact everyone yeah. in the same way. So I and think you're starting to see that even with the federal government. Yeah. I mean, and and I think that's a, especially as some things become I won't talk about them decriminalized, right? Um, that people's past um, indiscretions are being held against them in ways that just don't map to the current reality. And I will say, and I don't know if I should put this out there yet, I believe Department of Ed, yesterday or Friday, the days are kind of blurring together, put out some new guidance um, to, you know, institutions and individuals that serve formerly incarcerated on how to best do that. I haven't looked through it quite yet, but that's just a flag for individuals who are working with that population. And do you think you want to say on that one? Well, I think uh, if we do want, especially to uh, diversify mm -hmm. the student population, and bring in a big missing sh share of our population, which is a lot of young men of color in particular, uh, who have criminalized and incarcerated. Um, we have to find a way to bring them in. One thing I'll just note, I, uh, having visited these programs and um, visited federal prisons uh, dozens of times, uh, in the, at the federal level, people might be shocked to know that you, you often are barred from any access to anything, any technology except for a basic sort of minimal email function. I frankly think access to the internet in some way needs to be seen as a human right, as a fundamental human right at some point. And we are denying and depriving people of access to basic technology, including uh, smartphones, for example, and I understand all the concerns, uh, but we have to find a better solution. Uh, I've met people who then come out after a decade in prison and have never touched a smartphone. Yeah. Uh, that is not setting anyone up for success, and that cannot possibly good for, be good for our society. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Uh, I think we had a question over here. Hi, my name is Anita Bruno. I'm from the state of Rhode Island. I have a question. It's not specifically to college, but it's specifically on things that you've mentioned. Um, I'm a carpenter by trade, so I believe in the foundation of things. Um, you mentioned earmarks a few times, and I'm a recent um, person that just learned about them last year. But I ask that you explain, um, and again, talking about the foundations, right, building upon that. What is it? How do you apply for it, especially for um, minority community-based organizations that have no um, avenue or understanding of what that is and where those funds lie, and again, how to apply for them and what makes it, or may make it, in your opinion, a successful year. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Jennifer, I think that's I'm for going you. to handle that, but I might have to bump part of that question to this afternoon session with <laughs> Megan and Caroline as well. So um, earmarks are something that they now call congressionally directed funding because we don't want to call them earmarks anymore. So essentially this was something that for, um, God, for years and years and years existed and you had different, um, you know, different accounts on different bills. When you think about federal appropriations, there's 12 different bills. In theory, they pass all 12 bills by September 30th and we all hold hands and we all, you know, go forth with funding. Um, but none of that ever works like that. So earmarks were considered like, you know, a lever to try and press people to get the bills passed. Um, so what it is, is is each member of Congress essentially gets like, you know, I'll get like six or seven earmarks that they can do. If you're an appropriator, you get more. If you're a senator, you get more. Um, so essentially, 
individuals, organizations, institutions, they apply for these earmark individually with their congressional office. I believe this year, because the House went back under Republican control, they are not doing congressionally directed spending in the House. I need to check with my colleagues, though, to see if we are doing it in the Senate this year. So essentially what happens is, you know, you could ask about it when you go up to your meetings on the Hill, but there will be an individual in the office who will have a form that you fill out. Um, you know, a lot of folks will find the form intimidating. Um, feel free to ask your congressional office questions. The most complicated question is what count do you want to put it under? You could tell I did earmarks for years mm -hmm. for a congressional office. And, you know, what account do you want to go under? For, for most of you all, it's going to be under um, employment and training administration. Um, under, if it's more of a Department of Education, it would be under um, FIPSI, which is the mm -hmm. Fund for Improvement of Post-Secondary Education. So, you know, that's the most difficult question. But other than that, you just have to kind of like justify why, why this is important to the district, to the constituency. Um, you know, the other thing to kind of keep in mind about earmarks is, you know, a lot of times grants, in some ways, you know, people apply mm -hmm. for various grants. You can ask your congressional representative to write a letter of mm -hmm. basic support for your organization for grants yeah. as well. Um, that's something that's not well known. They can't be like, you should give them this money. Mm -hmm. But it can be, we think that, you know, XYZ organization is a great organization and they do great things. And it just kind of flags in the mind of the agencies that someone is watching them as well. Mm -hmm. And if I could just, yep, yep. I think your foundational question is so incredibly important. And, you know, I wanna, again, note that I drove for an hour to get here, but I'm only 11 miles away, right? So think about that where our institution is. Every year we bring students with us from Northern Virginia Community College and um, two thirds of our students come from minoritized populations. We bring our students to Capitol Hill to meet with our delegation. Every single time students have said to me, and they live right outside the Capitol, I didn't know you could do this. I didn't know you could go to Capitol Hill and actually talk to, like a staff would sit with you and listen to you. So think about that because, you know, these offices are open to you. You know, reach out to them. They're your elected officials, right? You probably won't talk to your senator or representative, but you're going to talk to the staff, which is probably more important in many cases, right? But, um, you know, bring folks with you. Let them know this is important. I am just constantly struck that you know, our students who live right outside the Capitol don't know that they can walk in and talk to a senator or a senator staff, a representative or a representative staff. Um, you know, these are foundations that I think sometimes we assume are in place, but they are not. And, um, and getting letters of support for grants, that also flags it so they'll track what's going on with it. That's important, figuring out what committees your people are on, that's important. Um, but some of these, to your point, they're just foundational, um, and we're assuming that people know things that they don't. And, and it doesn't help those who are on the outside looking in. Thanks for that. I think we've got time maybe for another question or two up here. Oh. Um, hi, I'm Sarah Welch. I'm with the um, Network of Jewish Human Family Service Agencies. And I was wondering what the, we see the role of salary caps at the state level playing with this. A lot of people, as we get them to education, um, that they want and they deserve, they try to move into the workforce, but those um, positions often in healthcare um, have salary caps at the state level. And so it makes those jobs less um, competitive and less incentivized to enter. So I was just wondering about that. And I see you nodding. Yeah, well, well I, we, I, we lost somebody the other day because of state cap, salary cap. So it's not just in healthcare. I'm sure Dr. Williams would say the same thing. Um, you know, the, we work in public two year higher education, and it, that is not when people think, oh, I'm going to make NYU money here. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is not what we pay either. So, directly germane to the skills discussion, it is incredibly difficult to get and to keep faculty in welding, automotive, healthcare, IT, all of these areas, because of the skill shortage, our folks can make so much more money working in the private sector. But as I, and I'm sure you have these same conversations, just telling people you're effectively eating your seed corn, right? If we can't get somebody to teach the next generation of cybersecurity specialists or welders, 
how in the world are you going to thrive as a business because you have no one to hire, so quit hiring away my people. Um, so I do think there's a real um, disjuncture between what's happening in the private sector and what's happening in the public sector that's not benefiting anyone. Yeah, the interesting conversation of you know having with a, a healthcare provider is, you know, I need more nurses, I need more X, and they're simultaneously you know giving retention pay to individuals who could have retired years ago. I'm like that person could come work for us and be a faculty member. They could do all these components, and so having these again these interesting conversations about wow, so you need a workforce, and as do we in order to actually provide your workforce. What would it look like for there to be a glide path mm -hmm. after a certain number of years where an individual can you know, practice, they can learn pedagogy, but then they're, they're transitioning, right? So you can still pay them their salary maybe for a few more years, you are going to anyway, but at least now they're dedicating themselves to the workforce, we'll train them on the pedagogy. So we're having these interesting conversations because we can't keep doing what we've right. been doing right. or else we're just gonna end up with the same results. But it is coming with these kind of new and dynamic options of, would you consider this? Mm -hmm. What about every four years, you know, someone takes a break so they don't burn out, depending on the field, and they come contribute to the teaching and learning in a different way, right? Then maybe they can work longer for you and all these. So we're trying to have these conversations, um, and some of them get traction, and some of them don't. It depends mm -hmm. on, I think, the business leader um, and the industry, but it's exciting to have the conversations. I think we're going to leave it there. I'm going to turn it back to Rachel. But first, please join me in giving a, a warm hand of applause. Thank you. Thanks so much. That was an absolutely fantastic conversation, and it kind of brings me back to some of the themes that we started with yesterday. I think, you know, this idea, all the solutions that we heard about today, it's about, you know, all the systems kind of aligning and bringing those together, all the stakeholders we heard about, community-based organizations as part of the solution, community colleges, employers. Um, so all of you being here to be a part of these solutions and to talk about these solutions tomorrow on the Hill, it's so important. Um, so thank you, you guys. Um, so next up, we have a couple of breakouts. We have a break first and then some breakouts. Um, this is where we're actually going to give you a little bit of a preview of tomorrow. So we've got uh, congressional staff uh, who are going to be in one of the breakout sessions and then White House staff in another. So this is a great opportunity to start having some of those direct conversations. Um, we will be back here in the ballroom for lunch at noon. We are asking everybody to do your best to be seated and ready to eat at noon um, so that we can... Uh, stay on time and have our featured guest, Randy Weingarten, who will be here at lunch. So go break, go break out, and we'll see you back here at noon.